The Tony Farina Report is brought to you by West Her Automotive, West Her Cares, and Batavia Downs Gaming and Hotel off exit 48 in the New York State Thruway, BataviaDownsGaming.com. Welcome back to the program. Is there confusion over cannabis laws? Who can get a license to sell it? Will you only be allowed to secure marijuana with a prescription, or will it include recreational use? Our Tony Farina helps sort it all out. Well, good day, and welcome to the Tony Farina Report on the Big Picture Show. The issue today is cannabis, and whether it's uh, how the beginning of this rollout of the cannabis industry in New York State is going. We have two guys here, two gentlemen, who seem to know a little bit about that. Tim Tuohy from Lewiston, and Michael Gall, former councilman from Niagara Falls. I think you're also a hopeful this year, too. I am, and cannabis and both, tourism is part of my campaign. And both you guys are looking to see uh, as, as, as your consultants in the cannabis industry. Now, let's take it from the layman's perspective. If somebody wants to buy a marijuana cigarette in Western New York, I'm sure they have no problem doing it, but legally, where do they do it? Where would they buy it right now? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question because the cannabis industry developed underground, so to speak. It's not a new industry. What New York State wants to do and has started to do is raise up the underground industry to be a legitimate business regulated by the state where individuals who wish to engage in recreational cannabis marijuana use can buy a product, whether it's edibles or uh, uh, flour in uh, bags of various sizes. The state hoped to make a big, yeah. big amount of money well, on this. Yeah, there, were an, there was an activist movement over the last 10 or 15 years to bring about, as California did in Colorado and many other states now, to bring about legal cannabis uh, production and sale. And it hasn't been easy. It's been bumpy. There's and been I, legal issues. There's I think it's, it's, it's understandable that if you're starting a new industry from ground up, especially with the legacy industry that is mature, it's been difficult for the state to uh, accomplish a bureaucratic system to allow that sale. Now, I'm getting to your answer, which is right now in New York State, the, the, the Cannabis Control Board through an office called the Office of Cannabis, Cannabis Management is in, charged with issuing retail licenses. To, to be, sell. To sell. The retailers are basically. And they haven't like, issued too many. No, they haven't. They've issued 90, I think. And only a small percentage of those 90 are currently in operation. None of them in Niagara Falls or Niagara Falls. The, the state divided the state up into 13 districts. Western New York includes the little more than eight counties of what we traditionally think of in Western New York. Uh, Western New York, and there's none yet. There's four that have been issued, but they're not operational yet. I, I think they will be shortly. So the places to buy cannabis legally in Western New York would be on the uh, native territory, the Tuscarora Nation at 420, the Shack, Seneca Nation, place like Seneca Hawk, or at the new. Seneca Casino location on the corner of John Daly Boulevard in Niagara Street. They just opened that up, right? They just recently. opened it last uh, week, and and I guess it's been pretty uh, pretty busy business there. Well, now, there's a distinction, of course, between the reservation-based cannabis sales and New York State regulated. They're quite different in that. Well, New York State's not going to get any of that money. Are New they? York State will get no revenue, no sales tax revenue, no revenue from the supply chain of cultivation, processing distribution, retail. New York has a license provision for delivery, which has uh, consequences to, in the taxing scheme. So none of that would apply to the reservation-based activity. It's not unlike cigarettes and, and motor fuel sold on the reservation. They are not required to collect sales tax. And, and the, the packaging and the testing requirements don't apply on the reservation also either. Although, so, as I understand it, the reservation-based businesses are having doing their own testing and quality control. It isn't like it's How are they free doing? Range. Any idea? There are a couple of labs in New York State that are licensed. Are the Seneca Nation and the Tuscarora selling a lot of it? Yes. Think? It appears that they are. Yeah. So they're, they've got a head start on everybody else, right? They're going to build up a clientele. Yeah. They're, they're, they're doing good business practices out there. I mean, 
it's like any other product, I think. You, you have to have quality in, 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 in the product. And it's not just flour. I mean, the, the, you can get pre-rolls or um, flour or edibles like brownies or chocolate bars or tincture or oils. Or, or a, a wide variety of products that are now available. Are there areas here in Western New York where they're growing cannabis now? The, yes. Are we just Wheatfield, waiting for a license? In we, well, in Wheatfield, there's a couple of, of uh, Be, growths yeah. that are licensed. If I can, uh, before the state issued the retail licenses, they established a system to issue licenses to growers and processors so that the cannabis retailers could get product that's been tested, authorized. They have a thing called seed to sale where they track new york intends to track cannabis from the point of its cultivation and, and processing thereafter into product and then its delivery uh, to a retailer and its subsequent sale there, there's there'll be upc codes or whatever that track each product so i got to defend the state a little bit that is the law became effective on march 31 2021 and there wasn't much action at all until Governor Hochul came in. Governor Cuomo had delayed appointing members of the Cannabis Control Board, which oversees the operation. Hochul moved pretty quickly to appoint a Cannabis Control Board members. And then, they, then they created the bureaucracy of uh, operators and people that undertake the bureaucratic aspects of it. It's taken time. People are very frustrated that it's taken so long, especially these cultivators who grew cannabis with the intention of getting it processed and sold by retailers. They and there aren't enough it. retailers. No, they're, they're no, losing money. I mean, one of, one of the issues, there's 62 counties in New York State. There's only 30, 31 enforcement officers across the whole state. So. Well, that's another issue, which is enforcement. This, this, the state's intention is, is to curtail unlicensed operations. It's going to be very difficult because they're sophisticated. They've been around right now in New York City, as I understand it, within the first legal shop that opened in Greenwich Village, there's 10 illegal shops within a mile. <laughs> so the state's just going to have a heck of a time closing those down. They don't really have a system to do that yet. One suggestion is that they fine landlords $10,000 a day if they're allowing a cannabis retailer to conduct business without a license. Now the state had hoped, gentlemen, to make a lot of money on state sales tax on the cannabis sale. Well, they project that by 2027, it'll be a $7 billion a year to business. $7 billion state. Seven no, $7 billion in sales. In sales. Yeah, so that would be a couple billion since it's so heavily taxed. 20% tax rate on the cannabis, so $7 billion. That's $1.4 billion in revenue for the state. Hasn't happened yet. They've raised $10 million, $10 million in taxable sales, probably, statewide. So maybe $2 million, $2 million only in, in revenue. It's going to be a big part of the budget. It's just going to plot along, but I think eventually it will mature to the point where it's not unlike the state liquor authority operation that that polices, if you will, liquor stores and bars and restaurants. Now, um, Niagara Falls will they benefit from the state hall on cannabis sales? Yes. How? It's similar to a, a, a state. The city decided not to opt out, so they automatically opt in. So because they're going to have a revenue there, they'll, they'll share in that revenue sales just like they do with other sales tax. It's split between the city of Niagara Falls, the county of Niagara, and then the state takes its share. In, in Buffalo, too. In Buffalo, too, yes. But it's taken, it seems like, forever. It's taken forever. Anybody who's invested money, especially these growers, um, are very, very frustrated. They, they have a product, they have a license, and if right now, if, if you're a grower in New York State, and there are, there's 30 growers, the only place you can sell it is New York City, up to the couple of stores that are open. Well, Tim, let me ask you this final question. We're a little short on time, but um, when do you think this is all going to get done and operating the way they had envisioned it? Within 18 months. Within 18 months. It's going to take a while. I, want, I do want to add that Crystal Peoples and the state legislature did their job by moving the They've legislation. You know, now it becomes a bureaucratic issue, which is what has caused somewhat of a delay. Well, it's been a little bit of a social justice thing, too, because you've got to get the right 
people to get the well, license. That was the first phase of licensing was designed and is designed to give licenses to social justice applicants, which are individuals that either have a pot conviction or a mem close memory of their family has a New York State pot conviction. And there's includes, some other requirements, that too. Women so too. That, that has also slowed it down because they want to issue those licenses before they, they allow the general public to apply for licenses. So that's really, I think, slowed it down their vetting process on the license and some of the other investigation. And so while it's taken a long time, you think at the end of the day, Tim, you said 18 months. What about you, Mike? What do you think? I, I think 18 months, but they still have to solve the banking issue. And, what do you mean the banking issue? Well, cannabis is still a controlled substance in the federal law. During the Obama administration, the attorney general said, don't enforce cannabis, uh, the cannabis prohibition in terms of uh, possession, et cetera, uh, but it's still an issue. And some banks are starting to open up. Uh, there's a story in Business First uh, the list last week about some local banks that are going to do cannabis banking. So I think that'll resolve itself. Yeah, federally chartered banks are, are prohibited taking money from cannabis sales right now. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. I, I think we're out of time, but uh, I think we'll have you back in another six months or so, see where things are. Thanks, Tony. Okay, gentlemen. We'd like to see a store open in Niagara Falls. Maybe we can come back at that time. We've been working with some people. When's that going to happen, Mike? I would say you'll see a license in Niagara Falls July or August of this year. This year? I agree. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Tony, for that report. Do you believe that you can alter your bad habits through hypnosis? Our next guest says you can. Welcome, Louis Ciola from Amherst Hypnosis. I'm so excited to have a chance to talk to you because people are so interested in something like hypnosis because they don't understand how it works, and, and which, which I don't, so I was happy to get a chance to talk to you. But I didn't understand that it can be used for these good purposes like uh, changing people's smoking habits or losing weight or reducing stress. How, how does that, how can hypnosis help those issues? Well, what happens is, is that many people will go to the doctor and the doctor will say, we ought to quit smoking, you should lose weight, you should stop having three glasses of wine at night, or you should, your, your blood sugars are too high. But they never tell them how to change your behavior. And it's not what you eat, it's how you think that affects your eating behavior, your smoking behavior, because all our habits are based on our thoughts, okay? If you, uh, if, you, if you smoke, or people will say to me, oh, I love my bad habits, I just love to eat, or, well, you gotta die from something, and that's a negative okay. self-hypnotic suggestion, okay? And they, ha they'll, you know, you know they, so what I do is I help them to change their thinking about their habits. So I use what I call the Barbie doll suggestion. When the kids are little, they play with Barbies, the little boys play with cars and trucks, and then they hit a certain age, they outgrow. You know, a certain age, the girls don't want to play with Barbies anymore. The kids don't want to play with trucks anymore. So there's no conflict whatsoever. So, so if you outgrow the smoking habit, if you outgrow overeating, or if you think differently about getting stressed out, it, it's not a conflict. Like, I, I smoked and quit in 85, but I've, I've outgrown the habit. Had I kept smoking, I would have been a train wreck. I couldn't have, you know, I wouldn't be able to breathe today. So the idea with the hypnosis is to change the thinking of, of, of what you think, and, and it's a process. Everyone loves their bad habits. There's no criticism. I mean, it's just human nature. We all love, we all love our chicken wings and our, and our beer and our, in our, our cake, our donuts, he heavy rich desserts and all that. I'm talking so, for myself. So, so what I do is I, is I place people into a relaxed conscious, it's a conscious meditative state, like a daydream, and then I give them the suggestion that you're older, wiser, and smarter, and you're starting to outgrow the cigarette habit. You're phasing out the smoking the same way you started, a few at a time. I don't like to do a one-shot miracle cure for any habit, because if people have been smoking for 40 years, you're not going to quit overnight. Or if you've been, if you're 50 pounds overweight, I tell them we take baby steps. Okay, it's it's like the old saying, how to eat an elephant one spoonful at a time. You, you're <laughs> not going to do it all at once. So, 
<laughs> so the idea is, is that you use the power of suggestion. Now, women use hypnosis all the time. They, they'll fix their husband a nice dinner. They get a little, little romantic, and then they go, and by the way, could we take this cruise? Or could I get the new washing machine? Could I get the new couch? You are so right. <laughs> could I get the new furniture for the living room? Yeah. Could I get a new car? My old one is so mm -hmm. terrible. And, and that's, I don't think that's hypnosis. I, I don't think of it as hypnosis. That's, but that's, it's a power. Or, <laughs> or, for example, if you need to ask for a half a day when you're at work and you mm -hmm. need to ask for a half a day off for a doctor's appointment and the boss is in his office and he's screaming at the top of his lungs at a supplier, you go, never mind, and you wait till he's in a good mood to right. say, and by the way, I need Thursday Tomorrow off, off. Yeah. for a doctor's appointment, okay? Does it take a long time? I mean, like you said, it can't just be one visit, for example, to get this, get your thinking the way you need it, the way you want it? Not necessarily. If someone, I have seen people who are, who are dramatically motivated, and you, I had, I had one client that quit a five-pack a day habit with one visit. Oh, wow. I almost fell off my chair. I couldn't believe it. He smoked five packs a day, and I have a special technique that I use called the nuke, and I bring him in and out of hypnosis six or seven times in the same session, and the guy quit a five pack a day habit. And, and so if, if you're motivated, if you have the real fire in the belly to, to change a habit, you will change that habit, and, and nothing's, wild horses are not going to keep you from it. That's what I was going to ask you, uh, like we were talking before about uh, hypnosis on cruise ships or as entertainment on a stage. Does it have to be a certain, you're saying motivation, it has to be a certain type of person that you can use hypnosis on? Well, there's a difference between therapeutic hypnosis and stage hypnosis. Now, a stage subject you can say boo to and they'll go into a deep trance. <laughs> a therapeutic subject takes a longer induction, but there's, I'm a good subject, but I'm not a stage subject because I'm, I'm too inhibited to get up there and, and do weird things. Me too. <laughs> but but, but if, if you, hypnosis is so powerful that if you ever see it in the movies, they never show the entire hypnotic induction. If you watch an episode of MASH, uh, the psychiatrist will say, focus on this pen and then they cut away after he brings him out of it because you'll hypnotize half the audience. Oh, really? Yeah, half, half the audience we, will be. We should use that to get people to watch, you know, if, in case they're not watching WBBZ. Right. We could, we could use that, right? right? I, I, I never thought about that. Now, how can people reach out to you? How can they find you if they want to? They can call to... me. I'm on the web, amhersthypnosis.net, and then they can call me at 839-3632. And is it very expensive? I mean, no, I, what, I'm, reason, very... I'm very reasonably priced, and, and, and if people, if money's tight, I throw in an extra visit for them. I'm, I'm pretty flexible. How did you become a hip, uh, hypnotist? Well, my did dad you, was a doctor, it... and when I was a kid, my mother had my younger sister with hypnosis in, in, in childbirth, so the doctor would come to her oh house, come to the house and prepare her for hypnosis. So years later, I got a degree in biology, and one day I was visiting my parents, and there was this brochure on the counter for a class in medical hypnosis. And my dad was an anesthesiologist. So I said, well, aren't you going to go to this? This looks really interesting. He said, no, I'm too busy. So I went. You went. <laughs> and I've been doing it ever since. And uh, it's, you've, had a long, you've been doing it a long time. I've got to ask you that. 1989. 1989. Yeah. So you're really and experienced. Certified with the National Guild of Hypnotists. It's, and it's and actually, I enjoy it. I, I work with a variety, variety, wide variety of people. For I've helped them pass the bar exam, nursing exams. I've helped people with their golf game. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I've helped young athletes with better focus, better concentration. Uh, There's so many uses for it. There's so many, as you said, so many variety of people that can, you know, get help by you. We thank you so much. It was so fascinating to talk to you. You can connect with Louis Seola at Amherst Hypnosis by calling 716-839-3632 and online at amhersthypnosis.net. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of The Big Picture. Remember to like WBBZ on Facebook and join the conversation on Twitter. I'm Judge Penny Wolfgang. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.